All right. Good afternoon, everybody, for the Rising Tide Foundation. Um, I am um, substituting for um for Matt. I'm a pure poor sub substitute. However, Matt wanted me to make sure I convey that uh, he and Cynthia would love to be on the show today. However, they are very busy in Calgary at this point, holding an event. Uh, so he asked me to jump in and uh, be the host uh, for Tony. Uh, Tony Chaikin uh, does not need a big introduction. Uh, Tony uh, has been uh, is an author, a well-known author. Uh, he has written many books. He has written Treason in America. Uh, he was a co-author of the unauthorized biography of George Bush. He wrote the book Who We Are, Volume 1, and he's right now in the process of writing his second book, Volume 2. Um, Paul, would you please put your mute on? Sorry, guys. No I have problem. my daughter here. Yes. Okay. Your daughter. That too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, uh, so Tony is, um, we are very pleased to have Tony. Uh, he is giving us a presentation today on uh, the historical backdrop of the border crisis. Uh, with a look towards uh, the oligarchical manipulations uh, to break up the USA from within. And uh, he's uh, discussing this uh, from going back to the mid 19th century's effort uh, to launch the Civil War and to create a Confederate slave empire under the Knights of the Golden Circle. And uh, all of this really uh, is being put um, at a head again because of the big crisis in the United States uh, around uh, around the issue, so-called issue of illegal immigration, um, which nobody really is discussing why this is happening. And uh, and Tony will uh, give us a little uh, give give us a, um, a presentation on why what is the cause of this, uh, which nobody ever wants to discuss. So with that, I'm giving it over to you, Tony. Um, you are co-host, so you can share your screen if you want to, if you need to. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll do it. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, what Madeline said about the uh, manipulation and an attempt to break up the country is not exactly the way I'm going to be approaching this. Um, so I, I would like people to keep an open mind about the subject because I, I think that the way I framed the title of this was the current discussion is a suicidal trap and how to get out of it, why, why it's a trap. I, I think both sides of the discussion about the border are are wrong, and and they're wrong because of what's happened to them, indiv people individually who are, who have these notions about the border, having to do with their souls. So, uh, I want to share some um, some pictures now. Probably a number of you have, were on the other presentation that I did for subscribers. I'm gonna use um, some of the same uh, slides, but I hope that we have a different discussion. And I wanna have an, a real discussion with you. So I'm gonna invite a, 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 a little bit of a discussion at different points as we go along, all right? Uh, because I, I hope to challenge the way uh, people are thinking about this. As I've been challenged to, to try to think through what's going on. All right, now I'm gonna do a share screen and I'm going to, can you still hear me, Magdalena? Yeah, just, yeah, I think so. Yes, Tony, yes. Okay, okay. all right. All right, now I'm going to do the PowerPoint. Let's go up. All right, now I'm going to start with the ancestors of 
Now, this is not good because the people are appearing. How do I get this out of there? Wait a minute. If you click up here on top where it says slideshow, then you don't have the pictures on the left. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Where it says slideshow, is that on? Up, up here on top. Oh, I see it. I see it. Yeah, and then go all the way to the left. It says from the beginning. Okay, now go back to slideshow. All the way there to the is. left. There you go. Okay, all right. Now, so th this concern, the first few sl uh, slides concern the ancestors of the people who are coming across the border or some of the ancestors anyway. So this is a picture of an ancient irrigation work in Peru, South America. The, uh, it's not just the Incas, there were other peoples that developed uh, advanced technology at different times. It, it had to do with, of course, with uh, feeding people and engineering to accomplish that uh, and understanding uh, different la uh, different uh, elevations and what they what they could grow at, at different elevations and and the uh, the the uh, the water that was available at in different places. So they they're they're carrying water from the mountains down into this kind of catchment basin. Uh, this is an ancient, uh, you know, it's an archaeological site. They've uh, uncovered this. Uh, here is some more from the works in different uh, reservoirs, sides. And you see the channel. There's another channel. Now let's go to Mexico, That it, it, just south of the USA. Uh, when the Spanish invaded they found this uh in the valley of mexico which is i, th I think the what's 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 called tenochtitlan here is where mexico city is now so these are five lakes uh and they are they contain islands. You can see some of the islands, but they also have these uh, th things called chinampas. That's around here. I guess these things are, are marshes, the other ones. The chinampas in green are in the lakes. Now, what are these chinampas? They are floating uh, islands that are artificial. This is something like it looks like, the recreation. Uh, and they they bring material in and build up an artificial land area. And they're anchoring it to the bottom of the lake. These are fertilized. And they also, in Mexico, um, created corn. Corn was not, um, didn't exist before these people in Mexico, some different people invented it, hybridized it, created it by changing uh, nature. Just as these floating islands are changing nature and it has to do with what they're going to do to use, use the water. This is a photograph from 1912, long after these societies were uh, basically deprived of the uh, the ability to advance themselves by the uh, colonizers who formed a new race in Mexico, the Mestizo, that is they intermarried, but but they, they had a different basis for their um, 
economy. Now, I want to ask, at this point, I want to stop my presentation for a minute, and I want to ask people who are listening, what is the relationship of what I just showed to the, the people coming across the border, aside from the fact that it's, you know, maybe their biological ancestors, what's the relationship of this to this border crisis? Why am I showing this? And what's wh why, why should you care about any of this? What's, what does this tell us? So can we, I'm going to get out of sharing the screen if I can. Let's see. Uh, how do we do this? I go to. On the top. If... Stop share. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Now, so Magdalena, you want to have some, see if somebody can answer my specific question. That is, wh why is this important? Why, what have I shown? What is, what's its relationship to the present crisis well, to the people coming across well in some sense you could say that it's colonialism that motivates people to want to leave their country and you're taking it way back to the roots well i wasn't talking about colonialism i was talking about uh, are you talking about the decline of a civilization can that it can go downhill all the way I think what he's referring to is at one time there was a flourishing civilization there. They yes. had workers, skilled people, knowledgeable people, regardless of how it was ruled. You know, um, they, they they did have um, an amazing. I, from what I understand, that like in Mexico, there was like a million people lived there at one time. That's right, right there. In that valley of Mexico, there were a million people when the Spanish came there, just there. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Let's let's think about this. What do we remember once the archaeology has been done and we recover an image from South America and from Mexico of these ancient people? Do we remember their, their you know, the, the uh, exact form of government of these people? Nah. Who cares? I mean, it probably was important, but uh, I believe that the people who did these things probably couldn't have been ruled by some sadistic maniac, right? They it, it, they would have had brains because, as you said, they were skilled people. Uh, but but what more more important to me? And it should it should be at the center of what people think about is that we're proud of these people. Look at their accomplishment. They made inventions and discoveries. They were elevating themselves. They they improved their living standards. People without these kind of things don't live as long. These are great achievements. And so we 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 as uh, fellow human beings take pride in these ancient peoples, and if they are our ancestors, we take a special pride. Uh, and so, what does that say about the people that are coming across our border? They have a certain kind of claim to our respect because this is the kind of people. They are at the bottom. They are they they come from a creative race, from creative for you know forebears. We're proud of our heritage in the USA. People are proud of lots of things, but this is the accomplishment. And again, this is a an accomplishment in physical economy. In the, in the improvement of nature for man's benefit, for the people's benefit, using resources, water resources, uh, the different kinds, soil, for the benefit of the people and for the benefit of their future. It's, it, so if, if you now are, are, if you're talking now, about the border crisis, and you're excluding 
this kind of consideration. And instead, you're thinking about wicked people in high places who control the world. And that's what's on your mind. I have a disturbing thought for you. Those who are preoccupied with the wicked people in high places who control the world, and that is what they tend to discuss most of the time, and, and that, that's their they, they develop a great knowledge about these wicked people to the exclusion of what mankind is trying to do. They are doing, in my view, doing the bidding of those wicked people in high places that they're complaining about. The, the peasant is told that uh, that uh, there's an outside world that he should know about and that he that it would be good for his soul to know about them but he doesn't know about them there's no railroad there there's no communication what does the peasant know he only knows that there are wicked no good corrupt people running society he knows that, and you can't change his mind about it. He knows he's wise. He's wise to the ways of the world, isn't he? No, he doesn't know anything. All he knows is evil. He's not skilled. And he doesn't really have an affinity for other people outside of his immediate circle, the people that he can see. He's blind. And his soul is crushed by this kind of society. And, and again, he knows the world, the rulers of the world are evil and conspire. Oh, you can't tell him otherwise. He's smart. Is he smart? Doesn't know anything. So in all of the discussions that you have about what's going on in the world, if you find somebody that is preoccupied with the oligarchy that runs the world, and they're going to tell you about it night and day and get deeper and deeper into the oligarchy, and they don't have any clue about what man needs in the world, what should we do different than what's being done now? Who cares? If, if, if there's bad people running the world, if you're not going to run the world in a different way, you're not serious about it anyway. You've got to have an idea of what are the human needs and how are they going to be fulfilled. That's revolutionary. That's a challenge to the misrulers of the world. You're not challenging them to find out that they're evil. They want you to know that they're evil. It scares people. You have to know what good things need to be done. And if there's some structures in the way or people in the way, we, we have to overcome that. But you have to start with what we're all about and what, our, what the needs of our family of man are. We have these needs in common. So let me go on now. Um, I'm going to go back to this PowerPoint. Share screen. Where am I? Ah. One need is for me to understand. Oh, here we go. Share screen. That's it. Okay. You see this? Yes. Uh, now. Oh, phooey. Nick, can you go up to slideshow? Slideshow. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Yeah, and then on yeah, click on that, and then go all the way to the left. No, oh, not from yeah. the current slide. From current. Oh, slide. I'm sorry. Well, oh, that's all right. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So just all right now. So here the USA. This is just it, it, now we're talking about the USA. This is Ben Franklin when he's over in England, and he had this circle of uh, uh, inventors and and human pro human thinkers, anti uh, slavery people really in England. They were not imperialists. They were interested in science and in inventions. They were. He had a group called the Lunar Society. He was the uh, master spirit for the invention of the steam engine. He was there in person as the science advisor at, for Bolton and Watt and many other projects like the canals. Uh, he, he was chased out of England in 1775 as, as the American Revolution was starting. Um, here's a question to ask yourself as we're going on. Why did Franklin help the British? He had a lot of complaints about them. Why did he help English people in this way? They, they This gave England a lot of power. Why did he do that? Think about that. Uh, if you say because he was a British agent, uh, then you don't know Franklin. You just somebody gossiped to you. Okay, next, let's see. How do we do this? Wait a minute. Oh, I see. Ah, damn. Uh, slideshow from current slide. There it is. Okay. So we, um, oh, I got to go back. On the bottom where it says slide 10 out of 28. I don't. I have a full screen here. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna worry about this. I'm gonna just go back. The British made a determination. The imperialists that no other country uh, was going to uh, was going to get the, the, these kind of power. So they 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 didn't allow. They wanted to not allow industry in any other country, modern industry, so that everybody would be under their control. So this is the East India Company that was in that if their faction got in control of the British government at that time. So now, if you go on to uh, Hamilton, we had uh, the Nationalists had a, a an argument with the slave owners and with the financiers that they were related to, and. Our nationalists said that we we're going to industrialize. And the, the, Hamilton had a debate on this with Jefferson. What was that about? That was about what was going on in the world. What was that? The dominant power, the British Empire, had new overwhelming powers, physical powers, that allowed them to uh, uh, predominate and control other countries. And so if, if we're going to have independence, we need those powers. That's what this discussion was about. That's, that's what the debate was about. There was a strategic problem facing the country. You can't discuss Jefferson and Hamilton without looking at the Industrial Revolution that was going on at the same time, right then. And what was the strategy? So there was a transatlantic faction that came up within the USA. And in this faction were, were the, the, the British Empire and their friends or partners in different ways in the USA Northeastern financiers and Southern slave owners. Now they, that transatlantic faction had a moral idea. And their moral idea was that economics is not related to what people think about when they think about morality. That's in a religious sphere or something else. 
and they actually put this into their religion in the form of Calvinism or something else. Their, their whole philosophy was cheap labor. Here's a picture of, of uh, slavery. The worst slavery was in the sugar fields. In the South, the uh, leading uh, political uh, powers, in, particularly in Virginia, were insurrectionists against the USA from the very beginning. And they were in with the British and in with these Northeastern financiers. But these Southern slave owners had a problem, and that is that their form of agriculture was destroying the soil. And so that was really impelling them to try to form an empire, to gain land uh, and new, new uh, workers slaves or or other form of cheap labor from the west from mexico from central and south america that they wanted to have a southern slave empire to go out and grab more land and use it up it's like they were using up the slaves lincoln as you know opposed the war against mexico that was done by our, our government when our government was controlled by the slave owners. Lincoln is a hero in Mexico. He, this is a mural in the government palace in Chihuahua uh, of uh, Juarez and Lincoln side by side. Lincoln said that man has creative reason that there are infinite resources to make a better world. Everything in the universe that we that we can have access to uh, or hope to have access to is something we can use to improve uh, uh, our situation through discoveries and inventions. Now, he also believed that people should work for a living, but not just do work. Not all work is good. The work of a slave is not good. The work of somebody who is trampled down in a cheap labor system is not as valuable as the work of somebody who's who's skilled. It's not just market value. It's a matter of, you know, your pride, your self-esteem, your, your, your pride as a human being. So he opposed the empire's cheap labor system. Uh, that keeps people ignorant and poor. You know, sometimes some people say, well, why don't those bums go and work? And they're talking about somebody that's unemployed. And, you know, it, 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 it's often the case that a very large number of unemployed people is a result of policy. It's on purpose. The people who thought like Lincoln and like Henry Carey didn't just make policies like a high tariff and national banking and cheap money and build railroads, you know, through the government. They also actually hands-on built the steel mills. They themselves, but this is these were private enterprises by people who were nationalists, and they believed in changing society for the better that is not the case with you know the transnational bankers today they're they're both businessmen aren't they so one of the things you have to look at in this history is what is the intention for what is going to happen in society keep that in mind that's 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 the the ultimate question about leadership What's the intention about what's going to happen in society? Now, one of the people in this nationalist faction that built the USA, built the big industries, was a fellow named William Palmer, famous developer of Colorado. Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, he, he designed, he founded Colorado Springs, and also 
he set up a company called Automatic Telegraph Company and hired Thomas Edison as a young man, getting him away from being a, a, a puppet of Wall Street, being just an employee of Wall Street. Palmer and his friends funded and, and sponsored Edison's independent inventing, got his career going. It was, a, it was a Philadelphia thing as opposed to New York. Not everybody agreed with what Palmer was doing. Oh, here, Palmer had the idea. Now, this is important. He wanted to develop Mexico alongside of the American West. Uh, and uh, he knew something about the ancient Mexicans. He talked about that. Uh, so this is, he built the National Railway of Mexico, and his plan was to connect Mexico City to Denver, Colorado, by rail, and build out to the two coasts of Mexico, and then have trade between Mexico and the USA that would develop and improve both countries for the benefit of both societies, so that people would become more and more skilled on both sides of the border. Not everybody agreed with this. There was another railroad called the Santa Fe. You're all familiar with that. Uh, that was run by a, a very uh, a hideous individual at that time. Here's the symbol, the trademark symbol for the Santa Fe Railroad, the British Lion, uh, because they were British financed. But this... Uh, the, the 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 head of that company when they were in a clash with Palmer was this guy, Thomas Jefferson Coolidge. Family made their money uh, in the opium smuggling racket in China. He founded also the United Fruit Company as well as running Santa Fe. And that led to eugenics and fascism and CIA get uh, plots to keep them in 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 power in central america so it's a it's an imperial venture so th this is the exact opposite now they they actually headed off the uh the the railroad of palmer going from to be able to go down through new mexico and they had they had wars at the at, at the passes very famous uh clashes As a result of the, this new imperialism, this is the child labor in El Salvador and gangs financed by, by the new opium, the, 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 the cocaine people. And, and they, those, those gangs are, uh, their money is, is laundered by the biggest banks. Uh, our Senate has investigated it and proved it. This is the rules-based international order. What does that have to do with our country? What does this have to do with the United States of America? Look at that picture. Let's, let's uh, stop this for a minute. And, and let's open this up. I'm going to stop share. And I'm going to go. So can you see now? So let's ask that question. What does that picture of the child labor in El Salvador. The El Salvador people come here as illegal immigrants, as well as legal, by the tens of thousands. There's also, I think, 70,000 members of Maratrucha, something like that, the, the gang, the violent killer gang, whose money is laundered by the biggest international banks, our banks, and British banks. So what does... What does that child labor have to do with the United States? Who can answer that? Anybody? Well, I mean, first of all, child labor. I mean, you're depriving these children of education. Uh, you're depriving these children of being able to contribute in a productive way to their to their society um you are telling them that they're worthless um but does the idea of child labor come from the united states what's our, what's our what's our contribution to the world child labor 
maybe there was child labor in the United States at different times and under bad circumstances and leadership. But really, the United States, in my idea of it, is all about a b better opportunities. So I don't think that the child labor in El Salvador is really based on American society at all. I think it's it's, it's the opposite. But what does it have to do with the United States then? Why am I why even bring that up with respect to the border? Well, one obvious thing is that they are trying the parents of a child in that situation not only don't want them to be murdered by some drug gang, but they want to get out of that hell. If they're even working, it's better than being murdered by a drug gang, I guess. But so it's chaos and, and terrible conditions. So yes, that's 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 one thing, but what is its relationship to the USA? Think about that. Why am I showing this? That's sort of the heart of this whole discussion. Well, we're influencing the politics of that country. Yes. How are we doing that? Well, economics and this history you just outlined. We've been busy, or actors and economic forces from the states have been busy there for a century or two. There's an ambassador there. And the IMF, the you know international so-called banking authorities, have their representatives, and they loan money to these countries under conditions that ensure that the debt will never be paid. It doesn't go to improve their ability to pay anything. So they have massive debts in those countries, and they are told by the U.S. Uh, officials that they are not allowed and by the IMF, that they're not allowed to use the resources, labor or other resources or natural resources of their country for the benefit of their people. That's against the rules. That's our rules. The USA is telling them that. Now, I don't think, when I say our, I'm using that expression lightly because I don't think we should teach our children that those are our rules. Our rule, what is our rule? Our rule is the Constitution of the United States. That's about self-government. That's our rule. And our founders were concerned about what? About improvement, about inventions. And they wanted to gear up our country to surge ahead as, a, as an industrial and scientific leader and with family farms that were skilled people, everything skilled. So that's who we are. That's our rules. This isn't our rules, but it's being done in our name. Our country, along with the, our British cousins, are enforcing rules on the world, and on, particularly on poor countries that can't fight back, that keeps them in hell. What's the... What is the benefit to us of doing that? We we get a lot of cheap goods. Well, yes, that's a good answer. That's that's a actually a pretty smart answer. Yeah, we do get cheap things like you can buy shirts made in El Salvador in Walmart. You can drink Coca-Cola for cheap because they get sugar from there. Does are these things good for us? Is it good for us to get cheap clothing? Not really. It's a lot better for us if we had really good jobs that were productive and gave us a good standard of living. Just because you have something cheap doesn't mean you're doing well. It's probably being done against your interests. That's like people saying, I want the farmer to get screwed and give me eggs and, and pork for, you know, uh, uh, five cents a pound. Is that really good for you? Not really. So what the farmer needs to be able to make a good living. And it's, it would be good for you if he did. You might even get better food. 
But what I'm trying to get at here is these people in South America, what are they? They're, they're some other people. They're not us, right? There's some people that are being used by our enemies who are pouring them across the border to ruin our, our way of life. That's just a stupid way to think about it. Who are these people? They're our neighbors, right? If you live in a neighborhood, you want the neighborhood to be um, peaceful. You want it to be prosperous. You want the whole neighborhood to be prosperous, right? If if half the neighborhood is is sick and and disorderly and 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 uh, victims of this and that, you're 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 not you're in trouble, right? Okay, now let me go on with this and get get past this. Share the screen. Uh, the next one is, oh, come on, come on. Slideshow, slideshow. What happened? How come I don't get the slideshow? There it is. Okay. So, okay. All right, now. Edison, is this it? Yeah, Edison went on to build power plants in starting in Pennsylvania. And uh, he and his partners introduced electricity to Europe and Russia, Japan, India, South America. Is that important? Well, it's not important if you don't care about anybody that you can't see. Right now, you can't see too many people. You're 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 looking at a screen, right? So if you don't care about everybody else in the world, then whether they have electricity or not, it's not important to you. I mean, I maybe I'm being too glib here. I shouldn't be saying it in such a sarcastic way. We'll get back to that question. Franklin Roosevelt found that the electrical companies that had been originally started up by Edison and by the local towns who co-owned them with Edison, these power plants, that these companies grew up, and in particular, the New York Center uh, and London Center had converted these things to instruments of oppression and not electricity they didn't bring electricity to farmers they didn't care that more and more people would get electricity they said oh, enough people have it already and so he built dams had public electricity government and also set up the means to bring power to the farmers rural electrification very important Now, this is sort of a heart of the thing. This is a picture of the president of Mexico holding that paper, La Lazaro Cardenas. And over, two men over, the, the old guy with the bow, funny old bow tie at the microphone is the American ambassador, Josephus Daniels, who uh, was sent there by FDR, a very close friend of FDR. And the occasion here is that the president of Mexico in 1938 was seizing, taking over foreign oil companies, Standard Oil from America and Shell Oil from England. And he did it because those companies were controlling the oil deposits in Mexico, but not producing very much of it. Mexico got virtually nothing out of this. So why should they control our resources? and just make some profit and tell us what to do. FDR supported the president of Mexico to seize this American and this British company and use their resources for themselves. That's the good neighbor policy. These people are our neighbors, right? They're also our cousins as human beings because we're all of the same blood. Certain minor differences between groups. 
The same kind of policy was with JFK, especially about electricity. He built dams in America, and he built he and Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana built this dam to provide electricity to West Africa. He also wanted nuclear power plants all over the world and thought it, would, it could have joint projects to desalt the water. His presidency, I believe, was the last American president in the fullest sense of the word. And his space program was our last fundamental technological advance. The whole philosophy of progress was abandoned after his his death. There are there are many people still that have certain parts of this. They believe in progress, but this became a dominant idea, a new dominant idea that we don't need manufacturing, uh, we don't uh, need really high wages except for me and my friends, uh, but other people we don't we don't need it as a nation. And the excuses for these things were various half-truths. Aren't you against communism? Aren't you against pollution? Aren't you, don't you want to express your sexuality? We, we need a new society uh, different from the, the old objectives to uh, get these things done. In the 1980s, uh, this man, LaRouche, Lyndon LaRouche, was, he's, he's, he, there he is in Mexico. His wife over here, Helga's, with the president of Mexico after he was president, Lopez Portillo. And they had a policy of, with, Portillo picked this up and really promoted it. He did a debt moratorium against foreign banks, foreign debts because they, they were being screwed on these debts. And they he, he had a program for very rapid development of a modern society to, to honor, in this way, their ancestors who were an advanced society. Why not do it again? Well, somebody's helping them do it now. This president of China, Xi, he's all over Latin America, Mexico, Central America, Panama, South America, building infrastructure, building up port facilities, building uh, uh, different kinds of uh, facilities. Then what you see there in this map, this is a paranoid map of the situation that only shows you the kind of things that are being done with China's help that pose a threat to the USA. Satellite stations that could spy on us and so forth. There is no such thing in this kind of illustration as progress. There's no such thing as any actual human needs. It's pure paranoia, and I believe that you will find that populists have the same view of this, that is, anti-government people have precisely the same view of this situation with China as, as the oligarchy and, and globalists that the populists claim to be fighting against. And, and, and really are. The populists receive this kind of paranoia uh, uh, doctrine uh, from, from, from somewhere, right? Where does it originate? I think it originates from the, from the oligarchs, from the, from the world government people. Those are the people that are feeding the anti-China frenzy that goes into these so-called conservative circles. What's missing here? Where are the South Americans and the Mexicans and the Central Americans? Oh, we don't care about them. What we care about is this Chinaman over here. We have no respect for China. Do we have respect for any of, any of the people south of us? 
do we have respect for them, for the people that are that are coming across our border? All right, so let me let me uh, get out of this and go to stop share, and that's that's the slideshow. And uh, what I want to do now is um, open it up for questions. I don't need some summary statement. I think you, if you don't get the idea of what I'm driving at, if you think it's just random thoughts, let's discuss it. I, I, I meant this as a, as a criticism of the two sides in this border debate. One side says, close the border, seal the border, and stop the people from coming across. If you do that as your, as your policy, if that's your policy, then you won't stop the people from coming across. They'll pile up there by the millions. How about the other side? The people who say, well, we, we care about these people. Let them come across into our country. We don't need border controls. If you do that, then you're 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 destroying the the countries to the south of us whose hellish conditions are are the same right you haven't done anything about that and you're also destroying the united states with with uh, cheap labor coming in with disorder and cities and so forth either way either side of this debate is completely fruitless I believe we do we do have the right to have border controls that that means something but unless you are addressing what is happening to the people in those countries you don't really have border control that is border control you have to repair the situation facing them and that means you have to repair the situation facing us do we need infrastructure do we need a space program do we need modern times do we need some education other than a strange sex? Do we need anything to do with man's, you know, dignity as a as a as a genius in in the universe? Yeah, we need that if we're going to survive. Just so do they. Their problem is our problem. Their enemies are our enemies. So uh, 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 just uh, one one more thing that I, I I really enjoyed getting into. I had an interview with um, Mel Kay, and she brought up the, the the book 1984. I guess some of you have read that. They made it into a movie. And it's about a future society where there's a dictatorship and they have all these foreign wars and they, they make people think, you know, here's our new enemy and so forth and then it's very similar to many things that have happened with surveillance and so forth and they have this guy that doesn't really go along with it named winston and he has a lover julia and so they subject him to various kinds of tortures and and once it becomes unbearable for him, then he loses his soul and submits. What's the point at which he loses his soul? This is so important. When he submits to the devil is when he says about the torturing, do it to Julia, don't do it to me. Now, I don't blame him. I'm not criticizing him. He he had more than he could bear. We all have hardships. I have had hardships, but they're not more than I can bear. This is, God has been good to me in that way. But, but that is the point at which you lose your soul. You submit to the devil. It is exactly at that point. When you do not feel sympathy, solidarity, 
and excitement about the good, uh, uh, you know, benefits of your of of other members of the of your family, meaning the human family, also your own family, also those who you love, or the neighbor that Jesus said you're supposed to love. How could you love people in South America? They're so backward, especially the ones that have just been shot. They're really backward, <laughs> shot by some drug lord. They're, those people are, are dirty. They don't have, they're dirty. I don't know, why should I love them? Why are they dirty? Well, maybe because they don't have modern facilities. They don't have irrigation in some places. Wow, they invented it. We could love them for that alone. So that's the point here, is that, that you, if you think you're being practical and the so-called idealists of the liberal cl class are not practical, by letting people cross the border. You're not any more practical than they are because if you lose your soul, you lose everything. You can't think straight. You have to have this solidarity with these people that are coming across the border and the people that are still back there in hell in those countries. Once you have that, you can think straight about the border crisis. That's the way out of this trap. Okay, Magdalena, why don't you solicit questions? Okay, I hope you can hear me now. Um, if you have a question for uh, Anton, uh, please put your name in the chat box or write your question in the chat box. Uh, you can also raise your hand, um, the yellow, little yellow wavy hand, okay, if you like. Um, and uh, keep in mind that uh, you don't try to hog the microphone, uh, that other people also have questions. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so far I have nothing here. Okay. Um, I have a question, Tony. Um, <laughs> you, you know, a lot You're the of... the teacher's pet. <laughs> yes, my own pet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so this morning Jerry was telling me something about Haiti, okay, um, that happened there. Uh, apparently the president of Haiti was ousted by the people uh, blocking the airport when he was trying to come back from Kenya. Uh, the prime minister, sorry, the prime minister yeah. of, of Haiti, okay. And um, so the the people of Haiti, they blocked the airport so he couldn't come back. And because of that, of that because of that action, he had to resign. Um, so, okay, how is it that we don't hear about this? This is the issue, right? Because I believe one of the things, the re one of the reasons we care so little or we have so little sympathy is because we don't know what is happening in South America, what is happening in Central America, and so forth. And um, the question is, um, we, not the question, but my comment is that we need to make an effort to actually figure out what is really going on in other parts of the world uh, and not rely on our on our media that we see on TV all the time. So that's just my my comment, really. Okay. okay. Well, you know, Haiti is a, is an old that's this is an old situation it goes back to the founding of our country. In the uh, early, early uh, 1790s there was a revolt of the black slaves in the Caribbean on that island. And uh the, the ref, white refugees came from there to the U.S. South trying to keep plantation life going. And the, the 
the real nasty uh, 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 anti-nationalists in Virginia used this to promote fear of blacks and fear of um, you know having any independent countries in the Caribbean or Latin America because that would be a, a revolt that was threatening to us, defining us as white people. And there was at the time, as everybody should know, a, a Toussaint L'Ouverture, French, uh, Haitian, who was a brilliant leader and staged a revolt against French rule that was, you know, running that, that place for, for sugar slavery. And the nationalists in America were, were friendly to him, Hamilton in particular. And we, we supported that. That is the best people here did. And that was a matter of debate. But there, this is a, this was the first black independent country and the first, uh, um, um, you know, it's the second republic, I guess, in, in the Americas, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, the question of what happens in Haiti has always been with us. You know, under the worst rulers, we sent troops into the Caribbean countries to collect debts, just like the British and so forth. But this background of this brilliant leadership, this, this um, nation starting idea by by the leader of Haiti is a very proud background and we should relate to that because our founders the best of them were were favorable to that kind of uh, uh aspiration by people we didn't want to go in and have a war with the with the foreign powers we didn't we didn't believe in that we didn't believe go out going out and starting wars because we don't like the government in some place however bad it might be but we were in favor our best people were in favor of the national aspirations to rise of other people is that our idea now what should happen there? It's clear in Haiti that unless they can be allowed to use their resources and their labor and, and the neighboring countries' resources as well, unless they can get together and have progress to modern conditions, we're, we're, we're screwed. I mean, we're going to get diseases, we're going to get spreading chaos and so forth. So it really is to our practical benefit not to uh, turn our heads away and, and say that the chaos in Haiti is none of our business. No, it's our, it's our business for the same reasons, because uh, they are, are human uh, and, and we used to have a better idea of it. Now we, we, we're, we so-called, are governing these places uh, to bring about this chaos by the rules that prevent them from doing anything. They have tremendous resources. They could grow anything there. They have smart people in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. people from Guyana, people from Jamaica. They're very smart people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anyway, next. Thanks, Tony. Um, I have a list here. Uh, we're going to go with Bruce first, then Pascal, Monty, Dave, and Paul. That's the order. <laughs> Bruce I'll try not to blab too much <laughs> and get some extra people go ahead okay. Anton I'm willing to bet you're wholeheartedly in favor of uh, a, a very effective and efficient procedure to uh, vet uh, applicants for admission and citizenship in a very very le legal immigration in a very robust way versus um, the either or of close the border or let them all in. Just speak into that, if you would, please. Oh, absolutely. That's true. That's border control. Borders uh, were, uh, were organized by the most progressive people in Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, they were, th th that's part of national sovereignty. 
uh, we had, uh, everybody knows we had religious wars in, throughout Europe between us and them, us being Protestant or us being Catholic. Uh, and uh, these were involved nations and parts of nations fighting each other for many, many, many years and slaughtering them in revenge. And each time they did that kind of slaughter, like is going on in the Middle East now, they said, we have to teach them a lesson. And of course, they were just killing their own children by doing this. The solution to this was an agreement worked out by uh, the cardinal from France, uh, uh, Mazarin. Uh, and his so the solution was, the treaty was to uh, agree to borders that were actually effective. And that meant that each country was to rule itself. And what happened inside the other country was none of your business, except it, insofar as they would accept the offer of friendship, the hand of friendship that you're offering, cooperation. And so that got people out of complete uh, annihilation in Europe. So many, uh, a very large percentage of the people in Europe were killed in these religious wars, directly or indirectly by disease. So the idea of sovereignty with a border, with, with a military for the purpose of military like fort building on the border, that's not the same thing as building a navy and going and shelling some country halfway around the world. That's you're not. That's, don't say they're both military. That's baloney. That's just a lie. The nation of Europe, uh, nations of Europe, like France, was a nation, and other other nations were established as well, that were strong nations, and I believe in the border. And I believe that immigration has helped this country and the immigrants that have come here have contributed massively to this country. My father was an immigrant, came here in 1909. And he was, you know, he loved the United States. I mean, my God, this is something, he came from Latvia. But uh, that's, you know, uh, people who, who uh, uh, want to protect the country yeah. have to get the, uh, the the real idea of sovereignty. Supposing you say that you are for a sovereign country, but that the government should not interfere in business. Think about that. I want the border protected, and I want a, a military to protect us from foreign enemies. But I don't think the government should be involved in business. Well, supposing people who are foreign, and I won't say what country they come from, but it could be London. Uh, supposing people that are foreign decide whether you're going to have good wages or not. Supposing they decide what happens to you in your life because of trade relationships, not just for us, but for people in South America. Supposing foreigners are making these decisions and you don't really have uh, 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 sovereignty. Sovereignty means that you're, you have a government that belongs to you and is supposed to protect your interests. Otherwise, why have a government? Do without it. And that's, that's sovereignty. Yeah. And, and as a segue or, or a diversion, how's progress coming with volume two and when can we expect it? I just finished this the, yesterday, chapter 10. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is called Palmer's Strategy for the American West. It goes into the Indian question and the mm -hmm. crimes against Native Americans. How mm -hmm. does that fit in with the idea of progress for American society and settlement of the West? How do those two things go together? How are they both true that crimes, terrible crimes, were committed against these, the Indians, mm. and at the same time, the settlement of the of this continent by Europeans and by Americans, forming a nation, resulted in 
tremendous advantages for the human race. We gave electricity to the world. We gave the world the idea of a sovereign nation in modern times and spread that idea to other countries of sovereignty. Now we're against it. If that's but, chapter 10, how many chapters in total are you planning? I'm. There's only two more after this one. The next one is about Edison. And the last one is is mainly about McKinley. And, and that's that's my, last, that's my last question. So others can chip in. Great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Pascal is next. Pascal, yes. are you there? Hello, Tony. Hi. Uh, so uh, Hi. it's I was wondering all throughout your uh, this talk. Um, you know, we we know what the enemies are doing like they're killing assassinating blackmailing all of these things and i was wondering what do you think uh in terms of the strategy for the nationalist of today what is it that they should do better uh or what should be the approach to do better than the one before that you talked uh so far I think that the nationalists in, uh, you know, in like this guy Palmer or like Lincoln uh, or like uh, Kennedy or like, uh, you know, FDR or like Alexander Hamilton or like anybody that did some good. Uh, you could even go back to historical figures, Socrates, Jesus, uh, people who believed in that man is is better than a beast that man has to have this this uh, wonderful uh relationship to his fellow man didn't they all lose haven't they all at some point come to the point where what they believed in was destroyed or overthrown so is it all for nothing no that's the idea of prometheus Prometheus actually, in one sense, lost because he was became under the power of Zeus. Right? He he had his liver was eaten by the eagle sent by Zeus because he challenged the heavens and gave man the power over nature, gave man the power of fire. This represents, in our idea, you know, the the benevolent God who gives us this this kind of gift that we can use our reason to to for these things but didn't he lose well he there he was chained to the rock no he didn't lose he suffered that's true but did he really lose no we did get fire we could misuse fire we could burn our neighbor's house down right that's the question of atomic energy right we can bomb people with it or we can you know, desalinate the water and get electricity and things. All of these people, so when you said, what can we do better than they did? I think we can learn from their mistakes, I suppose. I, I, I would say Franklin Roosevelt made the mistake that, you know, in, in a minor way that Trump makes in a big way. And that is not educating people about certain aspects of American history. He portrayed himself as a Jeffersonian. And that's not the kind of government he had. He didn't believe in, you know, no government. He didn't believe in just letting the people that owned land and owned the people who worked it dominate the country. He didn't believe in that. He was directly against that. But he said that Jefferson was, 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 was a good man. Anyway, those are minor things to me. What we can do, the real question is not doing better than them. I just was bringing those things up because I think it's an interesting question about winning and losing. You, you don't just win because you, you don't suffer. Or you're not, you know, you can be defeated in, in, in a battle and still win. Or you can win a war later on or, or whatever but the real question is what do we do in in a form in, in the discussion we had when for my subscribers it was raised the idea was raised that you had to use violence to 
overthrow the the oppressor. And the, you know, we have American Revolution, we had the Civil War, we had World War II. And of course, they didn't mention the French Revolution. That was violent. They didn't mention all the wars that accomplished nothing. You know, Vietnam. That was a real winner, wasn't it? Uh, uh, you know, the Iraq War, still going on. Um, they didn't mention that it, it, the, 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 the oppressor always sends people into, you know, activist organizations to advocate violence so people can get arrested, right? And on false pretenses. It's just stupid. Uh, because what's the real issue? You have to think straight and understand what's the path that we have to go on before you talk about tactics. Like, are you gonna, are you gonna, how are you gonna get rid of bad people? Like in a Western movie, you know, you're gonna storm the jail and shoot the bad sheriff. Baloney. It's, I don't even want cowboys and gunslingers in my West. I want what Palmer wanted. I want opera houses. I want good jobs for people and things like that. But so that the issue is what are the needs of the world? How can we fulfill those needs? What does that tell us about our relations to other countries that are our, our enemies or that, that or that we consider as beneath our even interest? like South American people and Mexican people. What, is, what does that tell us? What are the needs there? What they need is a burning concern to our country. Unless we solve their needs, they're not going to, they're going to be a danger to us. If we do help them solve them, it means that we are stopping hurting them. In other words, if we don't put them in hell, they might get into heaven. We're putting them in hell. So the, the first question is, what should the United States do? What should Canada do? What should people do? What should hu the human race do? What are the needs of those people? That's, and of our own people, do we need something? And right away, you have to confront what's stopping those things from being done. But as you brought up these past uh, nationalists, these past nation builders, they had visions of improvement. And did good some good things. They built things for themselves and others. Like Franklin going to England and helping them to develop. And then they the the, the misrulers chased him out. Mm -hmm. But that's what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Franklin was the greatest revolutionary. So what, he did, he wasn't a politician. He was a scientist. So that's that's what we need to do. Thanks, Tony. Um, Monty has been very patiently waiting. Uh, again, I'm uh, giving the rundown of the people asking questions. So first Monty, then Dave, then Paul, then Ginger, and then uh, History Man. So okay. Monty, please. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, very much appreciate the presentation. And uh, just a comment, uh, I'd like to position for a question uh, in relationship to uh, uh, to the situation in particular with the migration crisis and the roots of it, and in solving it, the need for, for development and uh, improvement, technological and scientific development and development of these uh, nations, South America, and really throughout the world. And I noticed you mentioned uh, Mel Kay, uh, who I very much admire her work. Uh, uh, you know, she's hosted uh, both Cynthia Chung and Matt Arrett on her show, so she's a very, very competent person. But uh, she had a Michael Yon on her show recently, 
uh, who's affiliated with uh, Brett Weinstein, who promotes his whole thing of the Darien Gap and the Chinese providing this infrastructure for uh, the the Chinese migrating people up here and everything. Right. And she seemed either unwilling or incapable of challenging on him on this. Uh, and so far as the real, I mean, there's a multiplicity of purposes for this migration crisis. It's cheap labor like Tyson Foods hiring all these migrants now. Yeah. It, so it also feeds into the whole Confederacy thing. You know, the, the states got to arm themselves and different states now are doing independent free trade with different things. So it plays into that. But I think the primary thing it plays into is the destruction of the potential for what uh, AMLO is doing in Mexico with the Mayan railways and also the infrastructure development projects yeah. that are designed through China, cooperation with China for development of Central and South America uh, through trade routes and infrastructure development, which would solve this crisis. Okay, and I, in get, line, I get that. Go ahead. Yeah. So in line with that also... Uh, uh, I'm, I see the same thing happening, and maybe if you could comment on this too, because this, it's not just isolated here. In so far as the deep state, uh, through a proxy wars throughout the planet, Ukraine and elsewhere, against basically the BRICS and the need for development. And, and the latest one I noticed, uh, Brian Berlitek on, on the new Atlas uh, just came out two days ago exposing uh, the U.S. through its proxies in Thailand, fomenting a war in Myanmar for the same purpose. You know, the the, the BRICS, the BRI lines through Myanmar and how they're disrupting that and a civil war erupting there. So uh, I know it's a lot I, I put out here, but I'm just seeing the okay. same thing happen. Well, you, the world. I think you raised two. I mean, the two things are, 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 that are really stand out to me are one what you said about the the, the supposed danger of the Chinese in the Darien Gap that means the the uh, Me uh, Panama that area that geographic area that there Chinese people are are involved there and that is supposedly according to this narrative a danger to us and then the other one is what you just said about the U.S. somehow getting involved in uh, Southeast Asia to foment a war in Myanmar. So the two questions there are, first of all, the, the China and Latin America. You, you, to me, there's a simple test that you can perform that can cut through the the head spinning that people get themselves into when they say i don't know what's true i hear this thing from him i hear that thing from somebody else and they don't they don't have any, the person who have, who has that way of thinking doesn't have his own moorings they they, they don't they haven't gotten their own philosophy they have different opinions based on things that they've heard and based on emotional responses a way to cut through that and really to get to a a fundamental truth is to start with the fact that the you are human i am human that is something special. Uh, many people don't believe that, or they're so confused, they don't know what to think, and therefore they don't have any basic philosophy like that. Probably they don't have a family either, or they don't think like a family person should. So how does that apply here? There's two, let's divide that into two parts. There's China and Chinese people, and there's Latin America, and there's people, Panamanian people and other people in, in South and Central America and Mexico. Are they human? 
What do we think about those people? What do we think about China and the Chinese? Somebody might say, well, I, I, I admire China, but I don't like the communists, or I don't like the president of China. And to me, that's, it, it, it's it's not an adequate answer it's 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 double talk do you have respect for those people that's a quarter of mankind in china something like that do you have respect for them if you have these stories that say that china china activity and it's always very vague it's based on reports that can't be substantiated China's threatening us. Well, what are they actually doing? Oh, well, they're building some facilities. What's that about? Oh, I don't care. It's threatening us. And they may be spying on us. They may be sending people here. You have no respect for the Chinese. You don't even care about what they're actually doing there. Well, they are actually doing things that that the, the uh, international bankers think is a threat to the order of the world, and that is to build up modern and skill-inducing facilities like modern ports and, and transport facilities. That's what they're doing in many parts of the world. What we should be doing. Why do we have just have to be the Chinese? What about the Latin Americans that they're supposedly sending here? What's our view of them? Are they human? Well, we don't think of them that way. We think of them as just hordes or, or herds that are coming our way. We don't, we, can, we have to be practical and not care about those people. Then you're living a lie because you haven't thought about these things and you're, you're just accepting what somebody's, a lie that somebody tells you. And these things about China being responsible for our border crisis, who says so? You say, well, it's, uh, what's his name? Tucker Carlson interviewed somebody, or Mel Kay, who's a very good person. And I like a lot of things that Tucker Carlson has done too. But what, the, what they're allowing to come through, as you said, is a lie. And it comes from people that are trying to divide us from other human beings so that they can control both of us. And the same thing with the war. Any war right now is wrong. There's no war that's good now. I mean, we've come to the point now where all war has to be avoided. I think you can say that without any, any exception. We should have avoided World War II by not building up Hitler like Wall Street and London did and so forth. We can avoid any war in modern times if you do the right thing. Well, that's next. Thank you. Um, Dave has been waiting quite a long time, patiently. Dave, are you there? Can you? I thought Dave's here, but it's you again. It's not Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, Tony. I just wanted to thank you for your for your talk again. Uh, you have articulated so clearly the Hegelian uh, dialectic that we're, we're once again thrown into and um, to divide us in multiple ways. Um, so I was wondering, um, in terms of what has heightened, what has what has gotten worse in in South America, Central America, that we're seeing you know, this new migration uh, crisis, I, I guess I'm thinking more short term, even worse than 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, I, I too, so heartfelt agree that um, providing a vision for the future for um, Hamiltonian economics and that I'm just learning about. When I, when I share with friends who are anti-China and, and, um, have bought into that PSYOP, when I share what they're doing with the Belt and Road Initiative and what they've done for their own people in their own country, the lights go on. And I remember seeing, um, just on another note, Cynthia did a, a, 
an RTF um, presentation on on a vision for the future, and she sh showed future cities, and I was just so so inspired by that. So I I do um, absolutely uh, concur that we need to speak more about vision as well for and and what is possible in going back into our history and bringing these great thinkers back. Um, so and then just to so so where where is Central and and South America and Mexico now? What's what's getting worse for them? And I was wondering about El Salvador and Bukele. I had heard you know he's he's done mass roundups of the gangs, brought um, violent crime down. What did you Bukele. say, Bukele? Yes, yes. And I, I also heard recently that he did pay off all the IMF loans so that he's out from underneath the IMF. Are you talking about the leader of, of El Salvador? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Just okay. wondering, um, about that. And that he's also working to get out from underneath the uh, um, Rockefeller medical big pharma system that we're locked into here as oh, well. I see. Okay. It seems like a lot of good things are happening in El Salvador, but. Well, I know one thing I saw is that they're weren't they talking about having Bitcoin as a as a, a currency? Yes, they do. Yeah. I'm not sure about how that fits in with the idea of sovereignty, but but let's let's here's here's my what I'm answering now. You you asked what you know you, you're posing a question of what's going on now that's gotten worse. And you also raised the, the, the your ideas about something that's getting that is potentially getting better. There's some a leadership that's moving in the right direction. I don't know the truth about what you're saying uh, with regard to El Salvador. I haven't studied it. Uh, in current, you know, uh, leadership and so forth. I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm generally of the view that the current leadership of especially of a small country is usually irrelevant because the decisions for that small country they don't have the power to make decisions for themselves that also applies to a big country if it's done with mirrors and smoke you know it like it happens sometimes in the USA but what i would say is this this is so urgent for us. The question of what actually is causing the people to leave these countries. It's not just a historical question going back to the beginning of time. It's an active question about things that are happening now and in the very recent past. You can go back, you know, 12 years to the Senate uh, uh, report of Carl Levin uh, that investigated money laundering. And it certainly applies today. He, they came to the conclusion that HSBC, uh, English and American Bank, uh, was laundering the drug money for the Mexican cartels and for the gangs, therefore, that sell their stuff. And certainly the same thing is still applies, whether it's HSBC or some other bank. They have to have international support. So that, that kind of thing is not to is not just from today but what we really need in my view if if you if you are serious in your concern about this border crisis then you would be favorable to the urgent need especially for the USA itself to get its own sovereignty back to set up a commission that is very, uh, 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 you know, oriented to, to our status as a republic. So people should be able to see what they're about in, in the light of day. A commission to investigate what is, this, what is the situation in the countries from which these refugees are coming. Really get into it. Get down to it. Without you know, no holds barred to say you can be, they don't need to be screaming. 
and they can be polite when they interrogate people that have to do with these countries. I don't think you should badger the witnesses and so forth, but they have to get to the truth. Who is putting these people into hell? And why? And what's that about? And how is that done? And what's the problems there? What are their needs that are unfulfilled? How might those needs, what are ideas, for uh, practical ideas that have to be very visionary because otherwise it's not practical because you have to go a long way from where we are. But the a commission to really investigate what is the situation in those countries? You're not serious about it unless you have some way of finding that question out, finding the answers. And, and in our country, in our system, we have a very good system for dealing with that. Our federal system on two levels has tremendous investigatory powers. I'm not talking about the FBI. That's baloney. They're, that just has been misused. I'm talking about the power of Congress to investigate national questions and the power of state legislatures to investigate many things, including broader questions. This is not executive orders. This is not sending the military somewhere. This is to get to the bottom of the truth of things. That's what we need. You, you need a searching inquiry into the actual situation there. And I guarantee you will not get that if you let those countries be governed by foreign agencies like the International Monetary Fund, the European Union, NATO, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those are foreign agencies. Absolutely. The United States has neighbors there, and we have a special interest in the Western Hemisphere ever since Monroe and John Quincy Adams enunciated this. This is our, our backyard. If we're worried about the Chinese, how come we don't have anything to do with these countries? We do it only through these international agencies. The USA sends an ambassador there, and he's talking. What comes out of his mouth is from the International Monetary Fund. It's not from the USA. It's not for the interest of the U USA. So we have the power to investigate what our fellow human beings south of the border what is their situation? Because it's impacting us, right? Isn't that urgent? Absolutely. It's a question that I can't answer, but I, but you know, as a citizen, I have a pretty good idea from our constitution how you go about, you know, figuring that out. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Paul. Are you are you still there? It is your turn. Yes. Um, Great. So I had a couple of questions up there, but uh, I think we've already covered them or come on to more important things. Is so, your daughter still there? No, sorry. I'll oh. make her listen to it tomorrow, though. Okay. <laughs> well, invite her to listen. Yeah. I'll, okay. Somewhere there, I try to. Uh, yes. Um, she's, she needs to understand these things. Well, when she uh, gets to be 15, then she w will know everything. And therefore, you better get her before then, too. And she reads a lot. I've got hope for her. She reads a lot. I meant okay. that sarcastically. Teenagers have that kind of a issue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 She's 12 now. That's already we're getting into that. Um, you, you talked about uh, Franklin's mistake and Trump's mistake. FDR. Not, F, uh, was it Frank? Franklin Roosevelt? About not teaching the history. Yeah. He about, knew the history and taught it quite a bit, Franklin yeah. Roosevelt. But on this, he was he 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 let a he let a falsehood through into the public. Yeah. What is how? And I see that. And um. And so there's two two concepts here. One is how to uh, is the history. Um. And what's your recommendation? Of course, your book. Wait, we're waiting for your book. But any in general outlines. How do we? I think. If for me, like reading Matthew Errett's book and your book a couple of years ago, uh, the American History series from Errett and yours were like really wonderful eye-opening events for me personally. 
And then, but I generally see people just don't know this history. These are great stories. They're just great stories about national, uh, whatever, national legends or <laughs> national history. They should be, everybody should be exposed to great stories about our country or, you know, us. And I guess, how do you, what are your suggestions? How do you get that out there? I think that's important, right? And then the other question is, um, I often hear this concept that industry is evil, technology is evil, advancements are just going to lay, no, the latest technical uh, technical advancements are just going to lead to dystopia and used to enslave us. And I see this as a very negative concept that people have and the reaction people are having. And again, how would you, how do you re talk to people who have this fear of technology? That's it. Well, um, go back to the first few pictures that I showed. And then the question that I asked. Uh, what is the relationship of those ancient peoples and, and what, what we saw in their engineering and their inventions, including corn, which was an invention, Earlier inventions were like dogs. Dogs were an invention. And horses were changed from what they were. But anyway, so, but, but engineering that you can really identify with, like irrigation. And that the, 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 these things are a source of pride that are, is really eternal because they have made a, such a deep change in what what it means to be human the human mind is always the same it always has that capability for genius it's always the same but what it means the full meaning of human life can really improve and that has to do with these inventions and these their cultural inventions like writing and other things and also physical inventions that that alter nature directly so we go back to these things that really inspire us and un, and we understand that the these this the physical economy that includes the, the the capability of the population to to do these improvements you know writing and education whatever but the physically things that have have inspired us much later and obviously uh, helped improve and inspire the people of their day. Study those things, especially. For the time being, forget about some of the other stuff. And I, I really mean that in a way that can clear away this haze that people are in about, I don't know what to believe. I hear this, I hear that. Go back to those things, the scientific and technological advancements that really improved human life and inspired people to a higher level of existence. And that includes, you know, a, a washing machine that runs on electricity for people, for a farmer's wife who doesn't have to, you know, spend eight hours trying to clean some goddamn clothes. That's inspiring to me. And having the ability to not see your child be hungry. That's horrible to see that. So the, there's different ways that you, you inspire with inventions. Don't you, I, I tend to cry every time I see a rocket take off that has people in it. I, it just gets me. I can't avoid it. Tears come. So that's inspiration. Um, but look back through history yourself and those you want to talk to about this problem, about how do we uh, find things out and how do we study history and how do we teach history. Focus on that's why I chose what I'm what I'm writing about, and I've been I've been focusing more and more on this angle 
for 50 years. Yeah, I wrote Treason in America and it didn't have this angle spe specifically, but it did have the two sides over this question. Now I'm going at it directly. I'm only able to do certain aspects of it because I'm not a scientist. Uh, you know, I, 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 I did my own study of history and I, along the way I had to study different kinds of technology. But this, this special aspect of mankind, his ability to do, uh, to change nature and how, how nature affects us both, physically change nature in, in some locale, and to understand mysteries and harmonies of nature and that can lead to wonderful changes that inspire and bring about an improvement in the condition of mankind and in the mental processes of mankind. Look for those things. There's so many different angles on it. You know, uh, people are having trouble with vaccines now, right? The, there's a, a the whole debate and, and rancor uh, clashes over the COVID uh, uh, lockdowns and, and the COVID vaccine itself. And I was talking to Matt about this, uh, and he was telling me about the the uh, difference between this vaccine for COVID and the vaccines that solved problems for people. Measles vaccine, the, the uh, what do you call it, the uh, polio vaccine, or just inoculations, like for smallpox, wasn't for virus, but I, I guess, but it was. I, I I don't I don't remember, but the point is that these kinds of medical advances have helped people. They are inspiring. The work of Pasteur. Uh, what was was inspiring and, and had to fight public opinion. So that's a change in nature to understand things that are unseen, but not mystical, not gobbledygook about you know mystical things that somehow in an unexplained way bring about these miracle things, free energy, and we don't even know what we're talking about. No, he's talking about something that that is a direct avenue for human beings to to uh, uh work in and on nature that's going to help us and he's very careful he's a, he's he cares about his the people that are going to use this so he's a tremendous hero pasteur and and he's doing things in the same realm you think as those who make this vaccine for for uh covid 19 but as Matt explained it to me, this is a different product. It isn't does it's not a dead vaccine. It's something new, something different. I guess it works on uh, the, the uh, DNA or the molecular level. It's not it's not the same kind of thing. Uh, how how can you get people to be in favor of technology and not uh not fear it there's many people talking about artificial intelligence and there's also uh, various forms of automation some of it sounds pretty stupid on the, on the right on the you know to start with like driverless cars uh i'd have to be convinced of that but anyway the the way to think about this is again go back to what people need they may not be able to express that need they need uh, uh they need to have the use of wonderful resources and potential future resources like you know for nuclear energy or for, for fusion or something but the use of of natural resources and and also the you know un, un, 
it's very important to unknown resources, Africa and South America and other poor areas. The imperialists never went in there to find out what resources you might have. They wanted quick money and they wanted to control the place. So think about the needs, fundamental needs first. You have to feed people. You have to have electricity. You've got to have protection for people from being destroyed. If you have 70,000 members of a gang, a killer gang in El Salvador alone, there's a need right there. You've got to deal with that. But how do you how does that relate to physical? Uh, you know, physical things. Well, people, why would a young person join a gang like that? Supposing the, the, the region had joint projects for building high-speed rail and space program and the kind of, of agricultural development that is, really gets you into 21st century, like those, like those chiampas in, that I showed it from ancient times. That's a, 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 an invention. Supposing that there was engineering progress going on in the region and children and young people and young adults had this exciting set of developments that they could join in. I'm talking about basic social needs and the relation of inventions and technology to that. In our history, this is something I'm bringing out, in our history, whenever there's a fundamental improvement of man's powers, like the invention of public electricity, like steam power, like railroads, it is always the result of the intention of some leadership to try to improve society. That is a revolutionary idea for, for a historian. It's not supposed to be that way, according to Adam Smith or Karl Marx, either one. Go back in history and look at the history of technology. That's what I'm doing. Not all technology. There's lots of good stories but I'm trying to concentrate on the really big questions. How did things get improved? What was stopping them? Who was stopping it? Who, who promoted it? Who helped it? Who fought for it? What was that about? I'm talking about scientists as well as statesmen and policymakers. I'm talking about private businessmen in some eras. Later on, you've got to have government regulation of business just to keep business being able to do business. But, you, you know, the model for a company doing some good still has obvious uh, relevance, as long as you have guidance from the Republic. But it's that intention to improve things. And the core issue is the improvement. And that is a matter of physical economy first. Study that history. Find out things. Ask questions. Where did these things come from? I Things I'm not covering or, or not dealing with. That's To me, that's the only serious way to answer your question, which is obviously a vital question. If you go to school, high school or middle school, and ask the children, the students, Tell me about where water comes from. What will they tell you? What does your daughter know about where does water come from that comes out of her tap? Where does that come from? Does she know? Maybe not. Do you well, know? The, process, you know? the processing plant in the village. Well, there is a processing plant. That's right. It, it's not free, right? There's a lot of work that goes into that and a lot of materials and a lot of science. 
if you just drink water from a river, and I'm not talking about pollution, I'm just talking about any water from any river, you might die. In any case, you can't just go to the river with a bucket and bring it in. You won't have as much water as you do now through your tap. There's a huge infrastructure and, and science uh, uh, organization that goes into that. And the children don't know anything about that. They're not taught about that or the history of it. The tremendous advancement that it took place in Canada, in USA, in Europe, and in other parts of the world. And that goes back to ancient times, doesn't it? Ancient society had the same kind of needs and they solved it in different ways. But that's first. Don't tell me about government. What government? What is that about? Unless it's about this, who gives a hoot? <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I. I have to laugh because uh, I post these questions to my grade threes, you know, like uh, um, where's water coming from? And and actually the question arose because one of the kids wanted to go to the water fountain, which is all the way at the other end of the building by the high school. And I said, no, why don't you just go to the bathroom and get the water there? And they're looking at me and they go like, but it's the bathroom. I'm going like, it's a tap there. Okay. And I said, look, there's one pipe coming into the building with water. And the water at the water fountain is the same water as you have in your bathroom. <laughs> That's right. It and is. they're looking at me like, are you crazy? Okay. And we're like, <laughs> no. no, there's one tap in and there's one pipe pipe going out. Yeah. And it was like a awakening, right? The same thing we had, we were discussing about city building and we were discussing about uh, the need for sanitation. And they had no idea, grade three, this is only grade three, right? They're nine years old. They had no idea that there's actually something called a sanitation plant that you have to clean, that you're using the same water over and over, okay? No idea, right? And these are just fundamental yeah. questions that these kids have no clue about. I mean, mind you, they know how to set up a PowerPoint on the, on, on the computer and all kinds of stuff, right? But fundamental questions like that, where the basic necessities come from for society, for, for, for our population, they don't know. Okay. Now, let, let me make a point about this. Yeah. The United States and also Canada used to be really on the job on these things. We used to specialize in this kind of improvement. We used to have people going to other countries in the Middle East or Africa or some other place, not just in the Peace Corps, but in other some other way, lots of other ways. And we would be interested in these questions. I know that Franklin Roosevelt got deeply involved in these kind of basic questions about fundamental needs. Uh, and um, we gave that up. You know, the kids are told the people in Africa don't have access to good water. So I want you to contribute $3 each. And we're going to send that over there to some NGO that's going to build a well in this one village. And one well at a time, they'll get water. Oh, my God. How horrible. Well, that's a sin. You're committing a terrible sin by doing that. This is where... The idea of charity runs into, uh, you know, being the devil's work because you're you're saying, I don't care whether they actually get water. Most of them, I care about just giving kids something to do that makes makes them think that they're they're accomplishing something when they're actually not, and the people are dying because they don't have good water. There's a billion people in Africa, without electric, half of them without electricity. So we used to do we used to do that. That's the important thing. Anybody else? It's uh, ten after four almost. Yeah, I was going to ask you how much uh, time do you have left? We still have uh, Ginger, Ginger, uh, and History Man left. I saw, and Gerald also had a question. Well, let's do Ginger. Ginger, hi. Okay. Ginger, are you still there? You're muted. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. I was muted. Thank you. You were so very patient. Thank you so much for waiting oh. this time. 
No problem at all. And I'm really enjoying the discussion. Um, I think Mani touched on this too. During your, on your channel, Anton, during the Q&A last time, Matt Eret brought up the trade agreements that now eight states have signed with uh, Great Britain. And I was wondering if you could discuss any issues you foresee with these agreements, like best case, worst case scenario based on historical precedent. I was really interested in getting your opinion on that. Well, since I, I haven't really studied the actual agreements that people have made or states have made, I, I hesitate to say too much about it. Um, the uh, foreign commerce under our constitution is strictly the business of the national government to set the laws for it. It's states always have agreements and and different contracts and 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 a trade, you know, on the state level or below that with with foreign places. I think the concern is that my concern is, and I, other people may have the same concern, that in especially with respect to the border crisis. You think of Texas and you think of other states that relate to Texas in a favorable way, that they are pursuing uh, the use of power, political power and military power. They're pursuing some kind of forceful alternative solution aside from having the United States of America do what it's supposed to do. And of course, the, the, uh, the obvious uh, problem of people being duped into betraying their country must come to mind certainly what happened in the Confederacy, uh, that people thought that their section was being invaded and they they joined up, but they 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 didn't they they had no knowledge or understanding of a long period of decades when leaders in Virginia and elsewhere were trying to destroy the United States. They never, they never agreed to the fundamental concepts of national sovereignty and independent, real independence of a of a of a nation. So that's that was this the real story, and so the the war against the United States by this Confederacy was was the culmination, the end of this push for a slave empire. And that was that slave empire was to be in opposition to the power of republic. It's one or the other. You you either have uh, the overwhelming power of empire, which gobbles up resources for commercial and other purposes, or you have the power of independent and sovereign self-governing entities, nations. Those two are in a clash is historically. So what does Texas and anyone else that's making trade deals with England, how do they fit into this his history of this clash? What's the big picture that they're not, that somebody's paying attention to, but the public is, it doesn't, is, isn't, this is not the public discussion. You don't have to say this is secession and I hate the, you know, the slave owners or something. It's not a, it's, it's beyond that. The United States of America is, is not following a sovereign policy and has made trade deals, for example, with Mexico and with other countries and carries out trade arrangements through the IMF and through 
world trade organizations, so forth. We have trade arrangements with many countries, if not all countries, that are against the interests of the United States and the countries that we made these with. Both sides get screwed in free trade as envisioned by the IMF and by the imperialists. What does Texas have to say about that? What, what should be our trade relationship with Mexico? Well, they can't concern themselves with that. They've got to close the border. They're going to they're going to boost the economy of Texas by making a trade arrangement with England. Holy cow. I thought that they were in favor of coal mining in the conservative movement. Didn't you know that Margaret Thatcher closed the coal mines of England? You know why she did that? For for two reasons. Three reasons. One of them was to break the union of the coal miners. If they're unemployed, they're, they're screwed. They they're have no power. Their union will break up. They were too uppity in politics. Number two was to boost the Russian oligarchy. Because if we get our coal from Russia and it's sent here by billionaires, then the nation of Russia goes down the tubes and it's not a problem to us anymore. And the third reason was global warming. We don't want coal mines. This is Margaret Thatcher, the great conservative. Coal causes global warming. And she was the master person arguing for that, the, one of the first in the world. Margaret Thatcher, the great conservative. Is Texas going down the road that England has gone down? Is that what the people want? They don't have they don't have energy for the people in England. Maybe I, I don't know. How about Germany? Germany blew up their power, their nuclear plants. Um, so I, I'm just saying that this is at best irrelevant to the reality. They're not serving what they say they're serving to do that they're not they're not dealing with the border crisis certainly they're not going to get sovereignty in texas by allowing the united states to not have sovereignty if you don't if you secede from the united states have you improved the united states no but you would say well i have to do for my people what but god you're in this world the world is governed by international agreements and authorities and powers. And that they are trying to prevent modern industry from coming to the most of the world. They're Malthusians. There's zero population people. They don't believe in having babies and things like that. Are you going to change that by having a private arrangement with England where, where most of this stuff is dreamed up anyway? This horrible stuff. So it's just foolishness. I don't. I wouldn't get, you know, my so and so in a ringer about about uh, you know that this is a new confederacy. It's just too stupid. It's too foolish because you're not dealing with what is right. And you know, how are you going to deal with this terrible human catastrophe of millions of people streaming towards and across our border? You have to deal with that. You're not going to improve Texas to the point of being a better economy uh, by, by trying to outflank it by making a trade deal with England. That's just dumb. Thank you, Tony. Uh, do you have time for Jerry's question or do you want to end? It, I've got to let, let's be the last one, okay? And then okay. I've got to go. Okay. Gerald? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Tony, I've been thinking about, you know, what you're talking about with immigration and and the way to look at it. And I wanted to, something that Monty said, he, he, he mentioned the Darien Gap. And I've been reading about this in the last week or so. And this is something I never knew. 
I mean, I thought I was well read, but I never knew this. Apparently, if you take, like here in Canada, you get on a train and you go down to the United States, go through the States, through Mexico, through Central America, you get to Panama, and the railroad just stops in the middle of nowhere. It just Yeah, that's what ends. I think. Yeah, you can't get to Colombia. There's no rail connection between North America and South America. And I thought, this is nuts. But, you know, from, from your presentation, I'm thinking that, well, if we have governments and countries that can't even figure out how to finish this railroad to connect Right. North America with That's South right. America, they're, they're not going to solve the immigration problem. Or, I agree. okay, uh, this is a better way to think. If we had countries and governments who were working on a way to finish that railroad, they probably would be in the right frame of mind to Exactly. properly deal with the immigration. So anyway, I just wanted your uh, comment on that to see if I'm getting what you're trying to tell us. Yeah, exactly. No, you're exactly right. And and so the the only question you have to ask is how come? Why doesn't it go why doesn't it go across? Uh the first the first railroad bridge across the Rio Grande to go between US and Mexico was built by this guy Palmer. It was in near Laredo, Texas. So it was done for the good purpose of linking up the two countries. Later on, we had a president, McKinley, and a, a, a mentor of his, uh, James Blaine. William McKinley, uh, in the late 19th century, worked with U.S. Army engineers and South American engineers. Uh, and, and that had been done before, but it, the final, the, the, the fullest expression of this was in a map that McKinley had and the Army engineers presented. of railroads crisscrossing North and South America and going between the continents for the full development. Now, this, this is an old idea, really, that people in Peru in the 1860s were trying to build railroads across the Andes to the going eastward into Brazil and to build railroads all over South America, to, not only to connect them, but to be... the the uh the initiator of steel mills all over south america so they were very ambitious and british started a war the war of the pacific to stop that ambition and to stop them from getting across the andes but mckinley had this program for building these this railroad and we were the french had were trying to had tried to build a panama canal And that failed. I believe it was sabotaged by Morgan and his, his faction. But leave that aside. The, the, the French plan failed. And so the U.S. was negotiating with the nation of Colombia, of which Panama was a part. It was not a separate country. We were negotiating with them to have the U.S. be the initiator with their cooperation of a canal that would be part of this kind of full-scale railroad development and, and other facilities to link up the whole hemisphere and develop the whole hemisphere. What happened to that, that, that initiative and that canal plan? McKinley was murdered. He was shot to death. Actually, it really, you could say while he was proposing this, it, he was at a, Pan-American exposition in Buffalo when he was murdered by, by I, I think it was this the same gang that, that did it to Lincoln and, and so forth. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt, who had been forced onto the ticket as vice president in the in the in the election just before that murder, became president. He had a history going back in his family and otherwise to, with the with the uh, enemy, with the Confederacy, with the British intelligence, with the bankers and so forth. And what he did was he said, well, we're going to build this Panama Canal, but we're not going to do it in cooperation with the Latin Americans. We're going to do it against them. 
it'll be for us to develop a an imperial outreach with navy to get through the canal and we in order to accomplish this we will rip off a portion of colombia it will be called a new country panama and so we don't need any kind of connection between north and south america because we are cutting the political and spiritual connection with them. The only relationship we have is United Fruit Company and, and various kinds of so-called investors who go down there to plunder the place. And so we, this is a way of saying that Monroe was wrong. That what happens in South America and, and Latin, in Latin America as a whole is no, is really none of our business, according to Teddy Rosso, except for collecting debts and make sure that our interests are served. What interests are you talking about? The interest in getting a banana? How about improving civilization in the whole hemisphere? How about cooperating to build up modern society? Isn't that our interests here and there? It's all based on, it's not just selfishness. It's, it's, it's worse than selfishness. It's, it, it's, it's contempt for all mankind, including the people in the USA. And that's what stopped the railroad from going across that canal that was built. That was a good project, but it was in the wrong spirit. It was built against Latin America instead of with them and in cooperation of, of all the people. That's where we went wrong. Teddy Roosevelt is a fool and a scoundrel. The British ambassador at one point said to somebody or other, always remember that the president is only six. That is that he's actually a six-year-old. So we can manipulate him and get what we want with Teddy Roosevelt in, as the president. Wow. Okay. Well, that explains a few things. Yes. Thank you so very, very much, Tony. Um, I think that was a very um, thought-provoking presentation. <laughs> um, I hope. So. I hope it created a lot of thoughts and 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 musings. Okay. Um, and I wanted to thank you very much. I'd love to hear back from Paul about teaching history and finding out about what to do with history and what conversations he might have with other people, even including his daughter, yes. but other people as well, teachers or, or friends or whatever. I'm really interested in what you brought up. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you everybody. so much. Okay. Okay. See you All later. Right, we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.